shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again. That's the Israelites, the, the, the descendants of Abraham. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. God is going to leave the tyrants alone until they've manifested their full tyranny for reasons that we don't fully understand. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between the pieces. All Albert Barnes said, the oven of smoke and lamp of flame symbolize the smoke of destruction, which we've already talked about, this catastrophe of, of the initial stages and the light of salvation. They're passing through the pieces of the victims and probably consuming them as an accepted sacrifice or the ratification of the covenant on the part of God as the dividing and presenting of them were on the part of Abram. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed I have given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river Euphrates. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children. And she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. So this is a big catastrophe for Abraham, especially in those times, and perhaps now, as much, although perhaps people aren't as conscious of it as they once were. I mean, for Abraham, without a... Uh, a biological son, there was no, there was no, there was no vision forward into the future, you know, and I mean, we don't really know what sort of time span over which these archaic people thought, but the medieval people, we already said, could think 300 years into the future without, without batting an eye, and these people who were, who were concerned about their descendants were obviously thinking about existence in a way that wasn't just focused on their immediate existence, right, they were thinking about well, their children and their grandchildren, maybe their great-grandchildren, maybe the whole society that, that stemmed out from them. And that's, that's smart. You know, one of the things I learned from Piaget, at least in part, was that his idea of the equilibrated state, which he thought about as partly part of the biological basis of the idea of moral progress. It's something like that. He was a very, very smart Piaget. And he said that the, the proper equilibrated state is one where Imagine you have a family, you've got five people in it, and you're doing what you want in your, in your family, what's good for you. But you're doing it in such a way so that the other four members of your family agree with what you do, and that it also facilitates them doing what they want and what they should be doing. And so it's a really tricky arrangement, because it isn't just for you, it's for you in a way that's for them. And you could also see that that would be something that would be a multiplier, right? Because if you have everyone working voluntarily towards the same common goal, then you get a multiplying effect of that. And then you might think, well, it's not just you and your family. It's you and your family today, and next week, and next month, and next year, and ten years from now. So you have to take the time span into account. And then it should be you and your family in a way that works well in society. And then it should work well now, and next week, and next year, and into the future. It should be iteratable, right? That's like sustainability. It's something like the idea of sustainability. And that's... that's I would say that's a reasonable way of conceptualizing the holy city. It's, it's something like that. You know, if, you're, if you're trying to make it concrete, it's like, how should you live your life? Well, let's say you live your life in a manner that justifies its limitation and tragedy. That's a good start. But then let's say that it does that in a way that also reduces the limitations and suffering of the people that you interact with, and now and into the future. Well, maybe there's a way to do that. I mean, a good negotiation does that, right? Because if you're negotiating with someone like your wife, for example, what you want is for her to agree with the negotiation. And one of the things that Piaget said, which I think was brilliant, brilliant, he said, if you take an equilibrated system, a family, let's say, and a disequilibrated system, so that would be one where, let's say, the father is a tyrant and everyone is operating under his whip, and you put them in a head-to-head -head competition, the equilibrated system will outcompete the disequilibrated system because the enforcement cost is such that it will slow the system down. You know, because you'll get resistances from the people inside the system. They'll work at, the system will be working at counter purposes to itself, plus there's enforcement costs. And so a tyranny cannot beat an equilibrated system. And I was really excited to encounter that idea because when I encountered it, I was also trying to figure out if there was some quantitative difference between the systems, say, of the Soviet Union and Maoist China and the systems of the West, apart from just, you know, arbitrary world interpretation as the postmodern nihilists might have it, if there was something fundamental at stake in the terrible Cold War that we fought, or if it was just a matter of opinion. You know, and the Piagetian take was that, well, 
roughly speaking, is that the West was an equilibrated system, not perfectly equilibrated, but reasonably equilibrated, in that people were essentially, even if they were slaves to some degree, they were at least voluntary slaves instead of involuntary slaves, and that that was better. The system was actually technically better, and not just as a matter of interpretation. So that's a lovely thing to know, and I think it's a really, really solid, really, really solid idea. I haven't been able to, you know, put crowbars under that idea and lift it up. I think it's a good one. So, 